Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Westside Unitarian Universalist Church Zoom service. My name is Linda Fippen, and I'm a member of the worship committee. Today's service will be a little different in that it is a collaboration of the members of the worship committee along with Wendy, Wendy Weiss, who is Westside's program and membership coordinator. We're glad you're joining us this morning as we look at the six sources from which Unitarian Universalism draws its faith. As usual, after the service, there will be our Zoom coffee hour, where I would not be surprised to see a few additional people who neglected to spring forward joining us. <laughs> Before we get started, I do have a few announcements. Just as a reminder, the Share the Plate partner this quarter is the Unitarian Universalist Association. If you would like to make a donation, visit the West Side website and click the Make a Donation button and check Share the Plate. Coming up at the end of this month, on March 28th, there will be a virtual congregational meeting, so save that date. Information about the meeting and the proposed budget will be going out to all members this coming week. For those of you who are new to Westside, members and non-members are welcome at this meeting at which we will discuss the budget and other church business for the coming year. Does anyone else have any announcements that they would like to make? Okay. Okay, then, as we settle in for today's service, Wendy will sound the Tibetan singing bowl. And just take a moment now to settle in where you are, to arrive, and to acknowledge that we are all here together, sharing this time and this space. And as we hear the singing bowl, allow those vibrations to carry through you. And now, uh, Wendy will light the chalice as I read these words from Eric Walker Wick Wickstrom entitled, For Each and For All. We light this chalice for all who are here and all who are not, for all who have ever walked through our doors, for those who may yet find this spiritual home, and for those we can't even yet imagine, for each of us and for all, May this flame burn warm and bright. Okay, now I will hand off to Ellen Greenwood. She's going to introduce today's service. All right, today we're going to be talking about the six sources of our Unitarian Universalist tradition. Some years ago, I read a book of essays about Unitarian Universalism entitled a People So Bold. In one essay, a young woman named Kat Lou tells of attending UU churches where she would frequently hear people say, UU is a means, you can believe whatever you want to believe. And while this kind of statement may be liberating to those of us who are fleeing the rigid dogmas of some religions, she found it disturbing. As she points out, People who live at the margins of society are subject to the whims of those in power and know that beliefs have serious consequences. Thus, Miss Lou did not join a UU church until she heard a minister clarify by saying that being a UU means you are free to believe what your conscience calls you to believe. Our challenge is that our consciences do not all tell us each the same thing. Many of us do come to Unitarian Universalism searching for meaning outside the confines of traditions that at best no longer work for us and in many instances have been truly harmful to our well-being. I suspect that this is one reason that many of us read the list of seven principles with great interest but just look right past the description of the sources of our living tradition. So what are these sources? If we were meeting in person in our sanctuary this morning, I would direct you at this point to open up a hymnal, either gray or teal, and read the six sources for yourselves. 
listed just below the seven principles. Well, we can't easily reach for a hymnal on Zoom, uh, but Wendy has, as she said, posted uh, a uh, posted the, the sources in our chat. So if you'd like to have that up, I think each of us will, will read and describe these to you as we go through our talk. But if, if you like to have it before you, it's right there. And I will just summarize briefly from the headings used to organize our gray hymnal. The living tradition we share draws from many sources. One, direct experience of transcending mystery and wonder. Two, words and deeds of prophetic women and men. Three, wisdom from the world's religions. Four, Jewish and Christian teachings. Five, humanist teachings. Six, spiritual teachings of earth-centered traditions. No wonder Unitarian Universalism is such an anomaly in the world of religions. We unite as people of faith with not one, but six widely divergent traditions. It's important to note that each UU congregation takes on a unique personality depending on, on its congregants. There are even a few UU congregations that are Christian UUs or Buddhist UUs or pagan UUs. And it's also important to remember that we are part of a living tradition reflecting the ever-changing stream of human thought and spirituality. If we had been able to look at the sources in our hymnals in our sanctuary this morning, some of you would have found only five sources because the sixth source, Earth-Centered Traditions, was not added until the mid-1990s. First and foremost, the sources serve as a guide in determining what it is that truly gives meaning to our lives. So let's take a closer look at each source, beginning with Wendy, who will talk about the first one. So our first source is, let me get my notes up here, the direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to a remo remo re excuse me, renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces which create and uphold life. So in this one, this is really about how we each have come to know our knowing, right? And in our history, it's been the holy ones, right? The prophets, the mystics. Those are the stories that we've been told since we were young, um, who have all had stories of wandering off into the wilderness or having to endure some type of isolation for an extended period of time. And then they return. And when they return, they each return with a sense of awe for having experienced something larger than themselves, something larger than all of us. Um, and their direct experience was way beyond what is normal in the daily experience, right? They, they had some direct experience beyond the parameters of what we normally consider usual or real. And so direct experience is essential to Unitarian universe, Universalism, especially in regards to understanding religion. So in this case, it's, um, you know, the Unitarian Universalisms have affirmed heresy, right? And even in some cases been the heretics because of um, their stance of being ones who courageously question and refute orthodoxy. And beyond that, they even dare to trust their own or their own experience over traditional authority. So this is um, a bit of our own tradition here in using this first source. And it's most noted and most recently noted um, the 19th century transcendentalists have had great influence on Unitarian Universalism in this uh, transcendent experience, right? And, and that finding inspiration in nature and, and to recognize that when we are in this transcendent state, that we have some kind of communion or communication, or we become part of this oversoul 
which you know encompasses all encompasses all of us and i can have direct experience to that i don't need to have anyone in between that in order to understand and one of the great um, ironies in my life or paradoxes is that i was introduced to the transcendentalist in my 11th year of 12 years of catholic education and i think it's always to me why i get a a little bit of um, twisted humor out of the fact that I learned this in a, in a parochial school. Um, and that that was the first way that I found my own spiritual resonance. Like, oh, this finally makes sense. I get this. This is what I experienced. I grew up in a city, so I didn't have much nature around, but I had an apple tree in my backyard that was the center of my spirituality. And I didn't know that till I read The Transcendentalist. So I just would like to leave you with these words from Ralph Waldo Emerson, and this is, our life is an apprenticeship to the truth that around every circle, another circle can be drawn, that there is no end in nature, but every end is a beginning, and, and under every deep, a lower deep opens. Well, for the second source, I'd like to talk a little bit about that. The second source reads, words and deeds of prophetic women and men, which challenge us to confront powers and structures of evil with justice, compassion, and the transforming power of love. We say that ours is a religion of deeds, not creeds. We look both to the example of our Unitarian and Universalist ancestors and to the UU prophets of our own time for strength and wisdom. We honor people like Francis David, the first clergy person in the, in the Reformation to proclaim religious tolerance. We look to the radical abolitionist minister, Theodore Parker, we look to Clara Barton, founder of the Red Cross, and Susan B. Anthony, who fought for women's suffrage. All of these were Unitarian or were Unitarians. We honor Reverend Waitstill Sharp and his wife Martha, who rescued hundreds of children from the Nazis in World War II, and Reverend James Reeb, who was martyred in Selma, Alabama, in the cause for civil rights and so many more brave Unitarians and Universalists. We do not lift up our own Unitarian Universalist heroes above all others, however, saying that only with them will truth be found. We seek wisdom and look for examples to the human, excuse me, look for examples to many outside our own faith tradition that to those who have spoken to the human condition and have worked to confront structures of evil. All of these are our prophets. We have had numerous discussions here at Westside over the years about ways to put our passion for justice and compassion into action. In some instances, we seem to make good progress, as for example, our welcoming congregation efforts. In other cases, we seem to make very little progress. Take, for example, racial justice. I find it interesting that this difficulty seems to be persistent in our history. When I took the new UU class that was offered to new members shortly after joining Westside in 1993, all of us in the class were given the book, Our Chosen Faith by John Burens and Forrest Church. And since this book elaborates on the sources, I looked to see what Burens and Church had to say about the second source in particular. After writing at length of heroic Unitarians and Universalists, Dr. Church writes, still it must be said, although Unitarian Universalists are prominent in the struggle for civil rights, when judged according to the spirit of the second of our sources of faith, our record is spotty. From its inception, Unitarian Universalism has been and remains predominantly a white upper middle class denomination. Those most vulnerable to injustice in our society, the poor and people of color have every reason to say, as George Templeton Strong, 
a 19th century writer, once said of many 19th century Unitarians, they are sensible, plausible, candid, subtle, and original in discussing any social evil or abuse, but somehow they don't get at it. My edition of Our Chosen Faith was published in 1989, and since that time, progress has been slow, but I think we indeed are making progress. Prophetic voices of current leaders in our denomination have taken the UUA to task over its lack of diversity in hiring, uh, calling for more consideration to be given to minorities, especially people of color. In our congregations, including West Side, we are looking more closely at what it means to acknowledge our own whiteness and colonialism and the inherent privilege that these bring. Our challenge is to continue to look for ways to confront powers instructions and structures of evil and justice with justice, compassion, and the transforming power of love. So source three is the wisdom from world's religions, which inspires us in our ethical and spiritual life. Every religion has striven to explain how the world and its myriad intricate and mysterious components came into being the nature of the human beings and their place in this world, what happens to those human beings after their deaths, and perhaps most perplexing what it all means. To say that the answers to these profound questions differ among religions is an equally profound understatement, as the history of religious conflicts that extends even into modern times clearly demonstrates. Even within a given religion, division into sects and denominations is widespread, if not universal. And yet, as Source 3 states, there is wisdom to be found in other religions for those willing to look for it. Perhaps the best known example of this is what is known in Western culture as the golden rule. Ideas equivalent to treating others as you wish others would treat you are common among the world's religions. But there are certain, certainly many beliefs and practices that are, if not unique to a particular faith, at least not widely known. Without investigating the religions that follow different beliefs and practices, one will remain unaware of ideas that may have great power and value. Unitarian Universalists have recognized that knowledge of the beliefs and practices of other religions would promote the understanding and tolerance of followers of different faiths, which is an essential aspect of the principles of Unitarian Universalism. Additionally, they recognize that as individuals become more aware of other spiritual paths, they may find new avenues for deepening their own spiritual awareness and understanding of the fundamental questions that religion addresses. Unitarians, and this was before they joined the Universalists, began systematically incorporating teaching about religions other than the Protestant Christianity from which Unitarianism first arose into their educational and other practices beginning in the mid 20th century. Study of other religions is now included in both adult and childhood religious exploration classes. A look through the singing the living traditional hymnal, that's the gray hymnal, reveals many examples of music and readings from other religions. Our wisdom stories often come from other traditions as do celebrations such as the water communion and the solstice spiral. Some congregations themselves may ultimately choose to identify with a particular religious tradition, perhaps Christian, Buddhist, humanist, or some other source. It is this knowledge of and openness to diverse religious beliefs that creates a welcoming home in Unitarian Universalism for those who find their spiritual journey blocked by narrowness of worldview that often prevails in other faiths. Thank you, Linda. Um, I'm going to uh, look at the fourth source, which is uh, Jewish and Christian teachings, which call us to respond to God's love by loving our neighbors as ourselves, which, you know, Linda touched on the fact that there are many religions that have that directive to us. So I was going to consider more uh, of some of the old stories, uh, the ancient Jewish teachings. Um, when I grew up uh, in the UK, of course, the Church of England is our, our official religion. 
<clears throat> we don't have the separation of church and state in the UK. So I was brought up in a Christian tradition, but some of the interpretations that were put on uh, those stories, I couldn't accept those at, at that time. Uh, but having come back to them in later life and being on my own spiritual path, I've been able to find some new meaning in some of those old stories. I wanted to look at uh, the uh, story of the eating of the apple from the tree of knowledge and uh, and what that's meant to me recently you know we usually focus upon the characters and uh, you know was there really a talking snake and who was to blame and that kind of thing but what about the central idea that all my problems stem from uh, the fact that I think that I have the ability to tell what is right and what is wrong and my mind is always dividing things up into uh, this is something that's bad for me and therefore it must be evil and this is something that is good for me and therefore it must be good and, and to be encouraged. Um, a lot of the um, spiritual traditions that stress the importance of meditation also have the idea that we need to suspend judgment at times so that we can actually see, look at the thing and see what it really is aside from my own judgment of it. And uh, that's something that I get from this, this story that resonates with me that uh, you know, a lot of my problems are caused by this incredible mind that's cutting things up and chopping things up into the good and the bad. Um, and right after that story um, in Genesis comes the story of Joseph who is kidnapped by his brothers and sold into slavery and um, you know, then falsely accused of something and put in prison. And all the way through that story, um, it's clear that at each step, even though he has complete right to be uh, embittered by the experience that he's had of being betrayed by his family and being wrongly accused, he never has that mindset. At each step, he always does what he thinks is right and lives his own values as himself in whatever position he finds himself in. So when he finds himself as a slave, you know, he carries on working hard and tries to earn the trust uh, of, his, um, uh, of his owner. And when he finds his, himself in prison, he tries to be helpful to the people around him uh, in interpreting their dreams for them. And that's something I found to be a, an incredible role model. I mean, one that I certainly fall short of, I uh, uh, often have found myself using other people's bad behavior as an excuse for my own behavior, but I have a, an aspiration to live my own values in spite of the circumstances that I find myself in and, and what's going in around, on around me. So those are two of the stories that I found uh, have resonated with me and all the good stories uh, have these depths and layers of meaning that yield to uh, inquiry and coming back to them over and over again in light of our experience and reinterpreting them. So, and that's one of the reasons why I love them so much. Ah, I enjoyed that, Chris. I would never, ever, ever, ever have thought of doing what you did there. So I admire it immensely. I'm talking about the fifth source Humanist traditions tell us to heed the guidance of reason and science, warn us against idolatries of the mind and spirit. If you find that second clause kind of unclear, I do too, but plunging on, at least tell us to heed the guidance of reason and science. Kendall Gibbons has written for the Humanist Voices in UUism, Humanism encourages us to live as fully as we can in all the authentic wonder and curiosity that the human spirit can generate. And it summons us to a persistent obedience to evidence and reason. I wish I could write like that, that's lovely. Humanism underpins both the universalist and the Unitarian branches of our faith. Universalists, while remaining traditional Christians in many ways, rejected the harsh, punitive God image that was very pervasive at the time they found it and it's still around. They declared God too good to damn anyone. 
all people are embraced. I mean, this is an aside. Um, a locally born, et cetera, woman who was our uh, administrative assistant at the counseling center for a long time asked me what Unitarian Universalism was. And I said, well, from Unitarianism, this from Universalism, that God does not damn anyone. And she said, well, that must be agreeable. <laughs> I think my church would never say that, but it, you must have a lot of fun with it. Um, yeah, it still seems radical to many people. Now, Unitarianism dropped most of the implausible elements of mainstream Christianity, beginning, of course, with the divinity of Jesus, Unitarian as opposed to Trinitarian. That's where the name comes from. In general, it also dropped religious tenets that kind of failed the test for plausibility in the world as it is observed. An afterlife, scientifically considered however attractive, looks implausible. Physical resurrection of the dead, scientifically impossible. Much of the Bible is treated as traditional myths or storytelling. UUism has kept the parts that promote human welfare. For example, some of the ethics. That's the nub, promote human welfare. UU humanism includes both theistic and secular branches. You can be a theistic humanist, you can be a secular humanist. In either case, reason as opposed to tradition or to the proclamations of an authority figure is considered central. And the conclusions of reason are to be checked by science. The scientific method briefly is observe, reason, and then test. By experiment or by prediction, but test. Science is trusted for its commitment to at least attempting impartiality and most powerfully for its self-correcting processes. Being rational doesn't have to be cold, although many people find it cold. I was delighted to see from Ralph Waldo Emerson, a 19th century highly intellectual Unitarian, not always considered warm and cuddly, who nevertheless wrote, we have a great deal more kindness than is ever spoken. The whole human family is bathed with an element of love, like a fine ether. Yeah, that's from a reading in our hymnal. Lovely. On to number six. Thank you, Suzanne. And what I love about the sources and the seven principles is it seems to me like the first and the last are reflexive. They kind of circle back around to each other. So our sixth source is spiritual teachings of earth-centered traditions, which celebrate the sacred circle of life and instruct us to live in harmony with the rhythms of nature. And being a part of the world, whether we observe it or not, we are following the cycles of nature and of the phenomena that is our world. So the moon cycles, the tides, the seasons, 
even just the rising and setting of the sun, for us to sit and observe these, for us to recognize that we're a part of these is the embodiment of direct experience. So earth-centered spirituality is rooted in ritual and devotional experience and spiritual practice. So while there are many different earth-centered traditions, what they hold in common are an embodied spirituality. And some of the ways of expressing this is through dance or drumming or chanting or droning or just even music, having music as a, as a source, as a center of experience. And sometimes even using any or all of these as a way to move into ecstatic states via these, these different um, ways. And again, as a way to have direct experience of being a part of the rhythms of the earth and the cycles and the seasons. And so through this embodiment, we are connected to the earth and, and also the rhythms of the humans who came before us. So turning back towards the ancestors. And so through this sixth source is how we come upon ceremony and creative expression and creative expression as ceremony. In the Unitarian Universalist tradition and specifically here at Westside, we follow some seasonal ceremonies. We have a water communion in the fall to bring us all together and that centers around bringing water from different areas from different travels and we join that those waters together to, to symbolize our coming back together at this time of year, each year a returning. And in the spring, we have the flower communion in which we celebrate the abundance of this earth through flowers and through the sharing of flowers. And of course, Linda also mentioned our solstice spiral, which is taken from another tradition and which brings us to observe and honor the passage of time at the, solstice, the winter solstice, the darkest time of year, and to bring some symbolic um, expression in lighting candles to celebrate the return of the light at that time and that, and that season as we're moving out of the darks of winter and towards the sunshine and the light of spring. So I would ask all of you, whether you're Unitarian Universalist or not, to consider how maybe you are doing this and, and you might not recognize that you are holding daily ceremonies around um, these rhythms. Maybe it's a sim as simple as that you pour your cup of tea at sunrise and watch it rise in the sky and listen to the bird songs. Or maybe before you go to bed, you sit and watch the stars at night and listen to the frog song. But these many different ways of experiencing and being a part of this ceremonial celebration of the seasons and the rhythms of the world. And one of them, um, I'd just like to leave you with the world's words of, um, well, I was going to say Walt Whitman, um, but I am having a technical issue. <laughs> so. I will um, just turn it back over to Chris to give us our closing word. Thank you, Wendy. At the end of the UU's Articles of Association, right after the, the list of the sources, it says this, and I quote, grateful for the religious pluralism which enriches and ennobles our faith we are inspired to deepen our understanding and expand our vision. The traditional wisdom of past religious and philosophical thinkers, the guidance of reason and science, direct experience of the processes of life within us and in the world. What an unlimited field of inquiry we've allowed ourselves. Luckily, it's matched by our soaring curiosity as you use, a zest for knowledge and an openness to new experience for ourselves and in our fellows. This is a vision that we have in in inherited from the founders of our association. When we come into our UU church home, we are not handed a set of answers to the big questions of life. Instead, we are invited to search freely and responsibly and share the joys and struggles of our journey with our fellow seekers. It takes courage to find and share your own answers 
and it takes open-mindedness to listen with appreciation to the hard-won answers of our fellow seekers. But that is our mission, if we choose to accept it. Go in peace. Thank you.